Welcome, everyone, um, here uh, to the live audience here in the bar at uh, in the Beton Halle exhibition space in Silent Green. My name is Mark Siegel, and we just I just played some pre-event music. Think Pink, uh, K. Thompson from Funny Face, uh, a song that Derek Jarman uh, uses in the garden. Yes, and I'm um, here welcoming you, um, both live audience, um, Heather Davis. Um, in New York. Uh, <laughs> people are clapping, Heather. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs> and I'm welcome you, welcoming you uh, here. Please, yeah, come in and um, feel free when you sit down. If you like to take off your mask, you can. If you want to keep it on, it's, it's all up to you. Um, but when you move around, we just ask that you put your mask back on. And there are um, bathrooms back there behind the audience. Yes, so welcome to this uh, series that I've titled Nature is Not Natural, AIDS, Collectivity, and Radioactivity. And it's a series of three discussions and screenings in this intimate bar space. So discussion, so bar talks. Um, because I love Derek Jarman's work as I do, his work in film, art, writing, and gardening, I was very happy to be asked to take part in this larger project, not only with my friends in the artist group Cheap, um, who prepared a, or made this exhibition here and up upstairs outside, um, the sound table and sound poles. Sorry, doing advertising for my own artist group in the midst of a group exhibition is not really so cool, excuse me. Um, but also because I was asked independently to join in as organizer of this um, very small discussion series. And so I thank Bettina Ellerkamp, Jörg Heitmann, Stephanie Schulte-Strathaus for inviting me, and also Marilyn David um, for the excellent support and organization. She's organizing as we speak, or as I speak, as well as to uh, Bennett and particularly Jonas and Jonas for the technical setup here today. And I welcome also our um, audience members online who are um, attending the live screening of this um, event. In the spirit of this project, which turns to Derek Jarman, this larger exhibition project, and specifically to his film, The Garden, as a departure point for a consideration of a range of historical and contemporary issues, I have conceived these discussions very broadly. They critically return to the local context of Derek Jarman's work and his film, The Garden, from 1990, to mine their relevance for a contemporary global situation. The discussions take us from AIDS to COVID, or from COVID back to AIDS, back to COVID, from a threatening nuclear power plant hovering over queer performances taking place in and around a beautiful, sparse garden, to the environmental catastrophe that is a dangerous horizon of our present and from the collectivity around AIDS activism to collaboration and collectivity in art and activism today. And I will, we're beginning the series um, with a presentation by Heather Davis, um, the title of which you see, The Queer Inheritances of Plastic. I'll just say a few words about Heather in a second, but I wanted to also draw your attention to the two other uh, discussions in the series because uh, all of those subjects I mentioned will not be dealt with in any one of these events, but hopefully cumulatively we will address them. And so on the 12th of August, that will be the second presentation, and there we will have um, a longer evening that begins with a screening of um, two works by the British artist Rahana Saman, who was a recipient of the Derek Jarman Award in 2019, uh, a presentation by Ed Webb Engel, a researcher um, and teacher who has been researching uh, AIDS activist video in the UK and will bring with him some wonderful rare footage of Derek Jarman. Um, Bashkar Sarkar, a uh, scholar um, at the University of California in Santa Barbara who will reflect on um, the aesthetics and politics of gardening and Bishnu Priya Ghosh, um, also a scholar, a professor um, at the University of California in Santa Barbara, who will um, uh, reflect on, um, 
on the biosphere, on gardening as a biosphere and its uh, implications for questions of collectivity um, then and now. So as you see, that, that, present, that will be a kind of panel discussion with brief presentations. Um, so there'll be a lot of um, topics that we'll deal with there, but there, that will be really the most specifically German um, event. The final event on the 18th of August, um, I'm very happy that I'll be able to um, present the queer feminist curatorial collective Club des Femmes from London. Uh, so Meyer and Selena Robertson will be here on the bar and they will um, present and discuss the film Carrie Greenham Home, a film which we will screen in 16 millimeter here at the bar um, at the start of the presentation. It's a British, um, a pioneering British feminist film documentary about the um, anti-nuclear organizing and activism among women, feminists, lesbians in Britain in the 80s. And um, Selena Robertson and So Meyer's presentation will draw particular attention to um, the experimental film culture that kind of developed in and around this feminist organizing. So it's a very rich presentation that kind of goes back before Jarman to look at a scene of um, lesbian feminist uh, collectivity um, around um, literally around a nuclear um, site. Great. Um, but today, we have the great pleasure to have Heather Davis with us. Um, Heather Davis is a writer and researcher who focuses on issues of contemporary art, politics, and ecology. She's an assistant professor of culture and media at the Eugene Lang School, or probably Lang, my, Eng my American English has gotten so uh, Europeanized. Um, Eugene Lang School at the New School in New York City. And she's the co-editor of two books, Art in the Anthropocene, Encounters Among Aesthetics, Politics, and Environments, and Epistemologies, and Desire Change, contemporary feminist art in Canada. But the reason I invited her to open up this three-part series of discussions and screenings is because I read a short essay that she wrote a while back on plastic and queerness that really excited me. The ideas in it are likely part of her upcoming book, Plastic Matter, appearing on, uh, with Duke University Press in 2022. While so much has been written about the toxic presence of plastic, both microplastics and maybe macroplastics, in our daily lives, in our bodies, in our water, in our air, in our environment, so much of what's written leaves me with a feeling of, we're all going to die. Just this kind of tragic, <laughs> how are we going to get out of this? Heather's essay, Imperceptibility and Accumulation, Political Strategies of Plastic, acknowledged the horror, but also turn to a queer erotics and to the sexual appeal of plastic in order to help us discover, as she puts it, creative strategies for living with toxicity. And her approach, um, I don't think it's, it's too much to say it gave me hope that there are different ways of uh, reflecting on um, and actually living with plastic. Um, at any rate, it was an approach in this short essay that led me to want to read more and to want to hear more. And so I'm very much looking forward to your presentation today, Heather, on the queer inheritances of plastic. So please join me now in welcoming Heather Davis. And um, well, thank you. Um, thank you so, so much, Mark. Um, it's a very kind um, introduction. And um, it's also, yeah, it's also so nice to think back on that particular work that I, that I wrote quite a number of years ago now. Um, and yeah, I just want to also thank all of the amazing production team. It looks <laughs> like I wish I could be there to like see it. <laughs> but of course, then I wouldn't be this disembodied head coming to you through this TV screen. So, um, but anyway, it looks very cool and um, really just very impressed with the whole um, situation. And just also wanted to thank those of you who made time to um, come and listen. Um, I also want to just acknowledge that I'm coming to you from um, Lenape and Canarsie land. Um, 
here in Brooklyn. And, you know, with that kind of an indigenous territorial acknowledgement, I also want to say that, um, I, that, that it's just the very, very first step in a process of decolonization that requires a lot more work and effort. Um, but that, that acknowledgement is important to me to understand um, who and, and in, in whose territory um, and, and with whom I, I need to cultivate relations and in this ongoing work of decolonization. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna jump, jump in. In the summer of 2018, as wildfires raged, I feel like this is this could have been this summer. It just wasn't. Um, but um, in any case, in 2018, as wild, wildfires raged and heat waves claimed the lives of 54 people in the province of Quebec, I escaped to the country, forests, and parks as much as possible, seeking lakes and trees that were sometimes, nonetheless, saturated in smoke. And it was kind of wild, actually, because you know I was out in the middle of the wilderness, as you can see here, and the the the, the water actually tasted like it had smoke flavor put into it. But I packed my bags made of nylon with helox, rain pants, and coats, silicon dishware, a spork made from Triton, my down sleeping bag with an outer shell of Pertex Quantum, polyester camping mat, and nylon tent would be further encased in a 75D polyester dry bag or a low density polyethylene garbage bag to protect them from the potential rain. Equipped, I set off with my rented ABS canoe and high density polyethylene paddles, gliding across, across lakes, quietly contemplating the feel of the water and the air on my skin, listening to the frogs and the loons, washing for a flash of beaver tail beside a dam as I drifted by. And everywhere I went, I shed tiny, these tiny pieces of plastic of all these fabrics with their unpronounceable, highly specific names. Like hair and pieces of skin, these synthetic materials sloughed off of me as I moved through waterways and portages, leaving bright red marks of plastic on rocks, as well as tiny invisible pieces of fabrics, traces of industrial engineering creating markers of my path and movements. Minuscule, almost imperceptible signatures of oil and its world-shaping residues, signs of this particular time in geologic history that will last for untold futures, enmeshed in bacterial and fungal becomings, slowly and inevitably accumulating. It's not lost on me, the irony of those movements and entanglements, the ways in which these technologies facilitate more comfortable forays into what we call the wilderness, um, how these two terms of technological progress and nature mutually support and constitute each other while always undermining their supposed distinction. It's part of the reason why I really love this framing um, that Mark is proposing. Um, in terms of unnatural natures and um, using Derek Jarman as a, and his investigations into gardens as a, as a beautiful opening to think about those things. But it's not lost in me either the way in which I borrow indigenous technologies such as the canoe to access parks that have often served as a mechanism of indigenous dispossession where the plastics I shed continue the legacies of colonialism. So thinking with and through plastic exposes the length of harms their entanglements and the ways that we cannot return. Despite the ongoing spread of toxicity, despite the continuation of harm, the earthly le lessons of plastic, their queer proliferations um, point towards a politics of decolonization that offers an expanded understanding of kin, responsibility and relationality, which is what I'm gonna talk about today. So Denise Ferrer da Silva writes that decolonization is quote, the unknowing and undoing of the world that reaches its core Plastic matter is at the core of the world as we know it now and as it is now. Unknowing and undoing are difficult, complicated, compromised work. It is a work of reevaluating, a hard work of learning to look and see again, to recompose our relations differently. It is the work of recognizing that we cannot return to a pristine world before plastic, but plastic offers us these lessons of intractability to imagine worlds differently, queerly through toxicity. So how do we begin to think about this pervasive state of plastic? It's like its longevity and its ubiquity. So one of the artworks that I turn to, um, <laughs> I hope it's okay to talk about another artwork in this series, um, but is uh, Taishel Shaw's um, 2012 five channel video installation Between the Waves, which was originally um, commissioned for Documenta. 
The artwork creates a world that blurs the boundaries between ancient systems and contemporary form when humans and our artifacts, plastic chief amongst them, are thoroughly enmeshed with non-humans. So I think, you know, in this world, just like in ours, um, there is no di differentiation or there's no way to, to escape or, or come out of plastic, right? Even the previous photo, part of the reason why I wanted to show it is because, you know, it's this image of this kind of pristine, beautiful nature. Um, and of course, you know, what I'm trying to narrate is the ways in which plastic is saturating that environment, even if we can't immediately see it. Um, so occupying a temporal register that is at once past, present and future, the, this piece between the waves, um, offers a mythic exploration of queer ecologies and a particularly poignant portrayal of a world saturated in plastic. So placed in this mythic world, Shaw invites their viewers to see plastic as agential and lively, but also as defying easy categorization. So much like in our own world, there is no escaping plastic in between the waves. In one scene, it appears that the characters are being birthed from the ocean. Image of, images of them bruised and bloodied are juxtaposed with footage of sea turtles coming on land to lay their eggs. There is something deeply primal about the scene. The characters lie in the sand with waves passing over them, entangled with all kinds of debris, including styrofoam and plastic coated wires. And as they rise and help each other wash off, we see that they are clothed in more plastic, bags and film refashioned as tunics. On one of them, the dress they wear is adorned with numerous CDs, which catch the light. The saturation of plastic and its creative reuse mimics the realities that are now virtually um, present everywhere. There is nowhere you can go to escape plastic. It is in the Arctic, the Mariana Trench, the deepest place on Earth, over 10,000 meters beneath the surface of the Pacific Ocean, and on remote mountaintops in the high altitudes of the Pyrenees. It is in the air we breathe and the water we drink. Plastic microparticles circulate throughout our bodies, including in human placentas. Nanoplastics penetrate our cell walls. Its chemical byproducts have been found in everyone who has been tested. So I don't think it's a stretch to say that the world is now plastic. So the inability to filter out plastic, to maintain any kind of a neat division between the synthetic and the natural worlds is shown in two other scenes in Shaw's piece. In one set in a mangrove forest, the characters wade around in the water, picking up plastic trash from the roots of the trees with a scythe. They neatly collect the plastic debris into another plastic bag in order to remove it. And, you know, I don't know about you, but I, you know, I feel like there's such an irony in, in doing this. And, you know, as I'm always, as I put out my trash, I'm always um, struck by the ways in which most of what I'm putting in the garbage is plastic put in more plastic, which is then put in a plastic bag, which is then shipped to a landfill. Um, and clearly, you know, this is what this person is doing in, the, in, this, in this sort of fictional world um, as well. Yet, even as this channel plays quiet and generous acts of care and disentanglement, the viewer is conscious of another channel, which I'll, I'll talk about at the end of the talk, um, which depicts a large landfill where this, where this plastic, this plastic removed from the mangrove forest um, will eventually end up. So it's a poignant reminder that plastic does not go away. It is only put somewhere else. In the other scene, the characters swim underwater with a constructed coral colony, all composed of plastic waste and e-waste. Plastic jellyfish float by, and these scenes are intercut with footage of marine life. But the juxtaposition does not pit artificial reality with a pure and taint untainted nature, but rather shows the ways that plastic is now nature. For despite the fact that plastic was designed as a protective barrier from the earth and other creatures, pl plastic cannot help but become part of the earth. It is still a material of the earth, even if in a purposefully oblique and engineered fashion. And I think that this is incredibly important to kind of recognize that despite the fact that, um, you know, and I'm gonna get into this at more length in a minute, but. But despite the fact that, that plastic was really designed to be, be this kind of universal 
synthetic, this like ultimate sealant or ultimate barrier between um, ourselves and decay, this kind of mechanism for sealing ourselves in as the kind of images of um, Monsanto house or hazmat suits or, you know, these um, fire retardant protective clothing or any of these things um, that supposedly seal ourselves off from the environment. What I think is so interesting about it as a materialist and the way in which it's become completely enmeshed with the environment. An example such as the plastic glomerate, which um, many of you may be familiar with, which is just um, a type of a rock-like substance of an agglomeration of plastic and other types of debris. So there's a way in which plastic um, cannot be separated from the, the, the so-called natural world. And I think that that to me, if we're, if, we're, if we're thinking about questions of hope, one of the, one of the possibilities of hope in that is the recognition um, that things do ultimately return to the earth. I think the question is, you know, how do they, what, what happens along the way, right? So Between the Waves also tells the story of waste colonialism with countries such as the United States, Canada, and Western Europe using Southeast Asia as a dumping ground. So most of our recycling ends up in places like Indonesia and the Philippines um, to be recycled there through manual processes that are incredibly um, difficult and devastating on the human body um, and also on the environments. Um, so although much of India's waste um, is generated internally, the artwork reflects the consequences of the aggressive marketing of plastic and plastic products in so-called developing nations that often la lack adequate waste disposal systems to deal with all this plastic. Although one of the questions that I always come back to is what country really does have the proper infrastructure for the mountains of plastic produced every year? Clearly, it's not those of us in the West either, because otherwise we wouldn't be shipping it halfway across the world. So plastic pollution, as science and technology studies scholar Max LeBaron has argued, can be understood as a form of colonization. It's not incidental in this context that the first landfill in India was created by the British during their occupation of the subcontinent. Regardless of where plastic comes from, it has the effect of transmitting a sense of universality. Plastic is designed to be divorced from a specific location, appearing as if from nowhere and coding particular places in this sense of globalized unlocality. Here it is possible to see how plastic is imprinted with the, with the colonial logics of dissociation, dislocation, denial, and universality, reproducing itself without regard for local cultures or ecologies. So, you know, given all of this, <laughs> I think it's, it's very understandable when, when, when people um, just feel overwhelmed or depressed, right, in the face of all of this. Um, and I think in some ways it would also be easy to read this um, five channel in installation work um, and the ecological ruin in between the waves as simply dystopian. The amount of waste depicted is overwhelming. The fact that it penetrates everywhere is overwhelming. But, um, you know, one of the things that is really incredible about the work, and I don't have any of the really sexy scenes um, to show you today, but, um, but hopefully one day you might get to see them. Um, but the work also conveys a capacious queer desire, a desire that cannot undo the effects of plastic synthetic universality or its participation in waste colonialism, but nonetheless offers potential avenues for living with plastic. Um, and I do feel very committed actually, um, as Mark <laughs> was pointing, was very generously pointing out, um, to trying to think of ways, not of denying the kinds of harms that plastic does or um, wanting to discourage um, the forms of kind of direct activism to limit the amount of plastic production, for example, but also to maybe find in this kind of trash filled world, um, something um, desirous, something maybe maybe slightly off putting, but also kind of sexy and also and also um, has a certain kind of ethical investment in questions of curiosity and closeness and trashiness um, that that actually I think allows us to sort of deal with with what we've what we've done rather than continuing to hide, run and hide um, or to just give up, right? So the artwork is um, permeated with a queer ecological sensibility that does not turn away from the horrors of our times or transmit a nostalgia for a pristine past, 
but instead offers a curiosity about what is present and what is possible here and now. So queer ecologies, in case you haven't run across this term before, um, is a term that was developed to contest the heterosexist assumptions built into biopolitical accounts of nature. So the ways in which, you know, we think about, you know, saying like to queer folks, oh, it's not natural, which is just blatantly untrue, but but we'll, <laughs> we can put that aside for a second. Um, and to um, imagine, reimagine evolutionary processes, ecological interactions and environmental politics in light of queer theory. And for me, um, as somebody who works sort of at the intersection of queer and environmental um, theory, one of the things I, I love about the ways in which um, queer theory approaches questions of environments is, is always with this sense um, that um, purity narratives are always to be questioned, right? So queer, queer ecology seeks to question all these purity narratives that are built around understandings of nature and to open up eroticism, kinship and care to more than human relations. So erotic gestures and acts of care between the characters and all the materials and beings they come into contact with transmit a feeling of connection in between the waves, even when this connection is built through networks of toxicity. So it's not that this is some, some utopian pure, pure um, haven from the world outside, but rather, you know, for example, the characters use black plastic gut gloves to have safer sex with each other and to caress the mangroves. But these same gloves are going to ultimately end up in the landfill. So one of the ways that I've been really um, thinking through these questions of the relationship between um, queer ecologies and plastic um, is I started because I, I found out about um, this thing that you're now seeing the image of, which is um, a variety of single-celled organisms that make up this microbial reef seen here on a piece of plastic from the open ocean, um, which is actually a, sort of an image of what, what the scientists called the plastosphere. Um, and the plastosphere describes the fact that microplastics now numerically dominate marine debris and are primarily colonized by microbial and other microscopic microscopic life. So the plastosphere, which comprises the microbial community of plastic on plastic debris, rivals that of the built environment in spanning, spanning multiple biomes on Earth. So there are these incredibly fecund rich spaces, right? Um, and, and one of the things that I, you know, really was asking myself is, is thinking about like, well, what is our kind of responsibility towards these new organisms? So when we think of something like the lifespan of, of plastic, when people say that plastic is going to be around for 100 years or 1,000 years or 10,000 years, um, the projected amount of time that it may take to successfully biodegrade plastics speaks to the mutual implication of bacteria and plastic. For biodegradation biodeg under most circumstances, um, there's some evidence that sun sunlight can actually biodegrade um, plastic under particular circumstances, but mostly it suggests an evolutionary movement rather than a chemical progression initiated within the polymers themselves. So in other words, um, the amount of time that we say um, that, that plastic is going to biodegrade is actually the projected evolutionary time span for organisms to proliferate that can successfully metabolize, metabolize it. So basically, how long is it going to take for something to eat eat plastic because it's an incredibly rich um, form of, of um, nutrients. There's a huge amount of carbon in there, right? So this is a, potentially an incredibly rich source of energy, not just for um, the world in terms of all of the carbon that we burn all of the time, all the fossil fuels that we burn all of the time as a form of energy, but also energy for, for particular kinds of organisms. And certain orga organisms can do this already. So there's two strands of bacteria that have been found in the stomachs of mealworms that can effectively digest styrofoam. Waxworms can also degrade polyethylene as they evolve to live in beehives and eat the wax, which is a similar molecular structure. So it was relatively easy for them to adapt. Um, there's a fungus in the Amazon which can biodegrade polyurethane under both aerobic and anaerobic conditions, um, and a number of other fungi were identified that could degrade plastics. And another example where the concentrations of, of plastic are leading to, leading to novel organisms, there was a bacteria that evolved in garbage dumps in Japan and was found to use polyethylene terephthalate 
as its ma major energy source. Um, and that was particularly of interest because PET is the primary material used for things like water bottles. So, and so in 2018, scientists building upon this knowledge accidentally produced bacteria that can speed up the process of consuming PET plastic through the enhancement of a particular enzyme. So the hope is that these enzymes can be harnessed to biodegrade plastics. Um, so in other words, that it would be used as a kind of new form of recycling, probably a much more effective um, form of recycling. Um, although there's also some concern that they could significantly degrade our existing materials and infrastructures if let, let loose into the wider environment. Although that might be um, more science fiction than fact. Um, but it's a kind of funny thing to think about. Um, the proliferation of plastic is pushing evolution to develop novel ways of dealing with this incredibly rich material. These microbial and human genealogies are becoming further entangled, even as the consequences of this evolutionary collaboration are unknown. So we can, following um, uh, science and technology studies scholar Myra Hurd, think of these new bacteria and fungi as indifferent symbi symbiogenetic organisms feeding off of capitalism's excess, proliferating and flourishing in our miasmic plastic soups created out of the unregulated advancements of chemical engineering. So each of these new microorganisms the bacteria and fungi that have that have evolved to respond and adapt to its environment, I would also want to suggest can be understood as a kind of a human descendant. So even as um, all of this kind of saturation in, in the environment is, um, is potentially limiting some of our capacity to reproduce um, and literally querying the bodies of people. So, um, so the kind of bimorphism that we normally associate with, um, with sex difference um, is becoming um, in many places because of the amount of toxicities in the, in the environment, both in human bodies and in other organisms' bodies like frogs, um, there is a way in which um, those bodies are increasingly starting to look um, blurred. Um, and I want to say that instead of running away from that, maybe there's something actually interesting and productive about that, right? So um, maybe there's a new type of off offspring dissociated from the heteronormative biological imperative of reproduction as the production of sameness, right? Like that maybe if we follow some of the lines and thinking of queer theory, which says that reproduction isn't just um, the production of, of new people in the world, um, but also a kind of reproduction of the systems that have caused this, right? So that there's, so that there's um, a reproduction that is always the kind of a desire for the same going into the future. And I'm trying to say that if we think about these organisms as, um, as a kind of human descendant, it breaks that relationship between um, between biological, um, the biological imperative of reproduction as the production of sameness. So instead, there, it allows for this kind of proliferation of difference in the world. Um, so just as Michelle Murphy, following Vanessa Agar Jones, argues that Monsanto could be understood as a kind of grandkin, quote, a toxic relation inscribed into energy infrastructures white privilege, indigenous dispossession, anti-blackness, water, and metabolism, these new bacteria and fungi could be understood as queer kin produced from the matrix of chemical companies, capital accumulation, modernity, techno-utopianism, and the creativity of bacteria. And here I'm very much like thinking with the provocation um, that Donna Har Haraway made um, Oh gosh, was it 40 or, or 40 years ago now when she wrote um, the Cyborg Manifesto, um, which feels still so incredibly relevant. Um, and one of the things that she says is that is that um, cyborgs are birthed from the relations between militarism and industrial capitalism, but that cyborgs are often incredibly unfaithful to their fathers. And I want to ask if, if these organisms are being birthed from this matrix of chemical companies, capital accumulation, modernity, techno-utopianism, techno how might they also be unfaithful to their fathers? 
for although this analysis is obviously very much a departure from traditional understandings of kinship systems that are either tracked through genetics, biology, or as in the definition given by Claude Levi Strauss, forged within practices of exchange, I would like to propose these bacteria as our queer kin, um, ones constituted through an extension of the human habitus. The widespread use of plastics and the responsive capacities of bacteria are a form albeit capacious, of renewed relationships that Elizabeth Freeman defines as the mechanism of queer kinship. So these renewed relationships between humans and plastics may not be the same kinds of reciprocal care, um, may not have the same kinds of reciprocal care that is expected from other kinds of familial bonds, but they do express the ways in which petrocapitalist subjects return again and again to ways of life that generate and proliferate plastic. And in, the, in this sense, maybe they do exhibit care for us by flourishing off our waste. Whether we, those inheritors of plastic, now or in the future will care for them and how is an open question. But I wanna insist that a kind of um, understanding of them as, as, as a kind of akin might allow us to think about plastic and plastic waste differently, it might invoke different types of responses than the ones that we've been caught up in. So, um, even if that seems kind of abhorrent to people. So evolutionary becoming seems to be especially fertile for bacteria. In many ways, the fact that plastic is leading to evolutionary shifts in bacteria points to the vitality and creativity of life itself. And certainly in the realm of gender and sex, it might be quite instructive for humans to learn from bacteria, especially in relation to queer forms of life, um, because bacteria have a huge range of... Um, of both um, sexual configurations and also the ways in which they, they, um, they reproduce. So if bacteria were understood as queer kin, the plurality of forms of sex, reproduction and gender that bacteria embody could metaphorically provide new forms of social organization. I realize we're not the same as bacteria um, for humans as our bodies increasingly morph into queer formations. So bacterial progeny of plastic create new organisms to understand metaphorically and literally the potential relations of sex and reproduction beyond sexual difference. So petrochemical relations could then be thought of as an intimate tying through lines of descent extended and enhanced through the durability of plastic and the evolutionary emergence of new forms of bacteria. Here, kinship that Freeman asserts as resolutely corporeal expands and extends the human body to the bodies of bacteria, challenging the bounds of the normatively figured and bounded body itself, while opening up questions of inheritance beyond the confines of property, genetics, and patriarchal filial norms. And one of the things I haven't talked actually that much despite the title of this talk um, is, is about this kind of question of inheritance. And one of the things I've been really preoccupied with in relationship to plastic is really thinking about what are the inheritances of plastic? What were the kinds of philosophical and material investments that allowed plastic to emerge in the world in the first place? And then what is our responsibility um, in relationship to that inheritance? How do we reconfigure it? How do we, what do we learn from it? What do we take from it? And when do we leave aside? Um, and the other reason why inheritance is so interesting and important to me is because inheritance is often the mechanism for shoring up wealth and privilege. Um, and certainly in relationship to plastic, um, it does exactly that through, through different forms of infrastructures, which is that you can see the ways in which plastic shores up wealth and privilege for the few, right? Um, primarily white wealthy people um, and while it's distributing toxicity um, to other people. And, and so by breaking with this kind of inheritance, by this kind of filial norms, these patriarchal filial norms, and by introducing a different type of an inheritance um, through questions of our relations, interhuman relations to questions of bacteria and genetics, I hope to kind of intervene a little bit in these processes, even in, in just a kind of metaphorical way. So to acknowledge that the future will be queer in the sense of completely disruptive, means also finding a way to live with toxicity. For toxicity is already here. Um, and obviously, you know, one of the problems with plastic is the ways in which it accumulates toxicity. So it's toxic in two ways. One is that there, 
some plastics are just toxic. So things like PVC is an incredibly toxic material, not so much to the consumer, but definitely in its production phase and also in um, the phase of, of recycling it or incinerating it or any of those kinds of things. And then also there's a huge amount of additive, additives that are added to all kinds of otherwise relatively safe plastics, such as polyethylene or um, polypropylene. And those can be incredibly toxic to us. And then in addition to that, when, when plastics circulate in the environment, because they're oil-based oil -based, um, um, entities, oil-based materials, it means that they glom on to all the other things that are like them. So even things that have been banned for a while, such as DDT, um, tend to latch on to plastics. So toxic, so plastic is really spreading this kind of toxicity throughout um, the environment. But I also I want to suggest that that um, um, that embracing the kind of strange alliances and ambivalences of queerness and petrochemicals may allow for new types of analysis for a queer knowledge production that gives some remedy for structural um, that gives some means for structural remedy while also not abandoning a claim to just being a little bit off. So what if you know like some of the ways in which we think about plastic like as cheap as toxic, for example. Um, are also the ways in which we think often about queer, queerness and queer communities. So what if we, what if we, instead of just balking and turning away from that, what if we learn to embrace it just a little bit, right? The lessons of queer social structures, a family is not based on biology and lives not necessarily afforded protection from the state or other institutions of power might be instructive in facing both our non-filial, non-human progeny so the bacteria and these fungi that are developing as a part of an evolutionary response to the proliferation of plastic and a world filled with increasing uncertainty. So as toxicity permeates everything, um, I think that, that it's obviously not good, <laughs> right? But, and I don't wanna sort of say that, um, that people should be exposed to these things, but since we are, I think that the question that, that really thinking through the ethics of the future um, and the futures that are already present requires a kind of lateral connection um, and really thinking about the potentially kind of disruptive um, and uh, generative aspects of this, I think is useful. So instead of biological children, plasticized microbial progeny will offer a decidedly queerer world, one that is being birthed from the violence of our present moments. So how would we begin to situate a feminist responsibility as Donna Haraway has called it, as in the ability to respond um, to these broad lines of connection from our ancestors to our queer descendants. Landfill Dance, the, one of the channels in between the waves depicts what the title would suggest. Multiple femme performers dancing on top of a landfill in costumes equipped with improvised gas masks. The dancers' gestures come from ballet and contemporary dance, but also convey an intimacy and even aspects of care with the garbage that they are dancing on and crawling over. So just as their bodies are nearly swallowed up by this giant pile of trash, in one instance, a dancer picks up a tiny ceramic jug, examining it, demonstrating an attentive curiosity for this putrid environment. This video can be understood as an indictment of what we have made of the world, how it has been rendered toxic and uninhabitable. And I think it is. Importantly, it also asks us to move closer to the site of devastation, to move in, to become acquainted and to invite creativity and movement. This invitation to become more curious about plastic does not eschew the very real damage it is doing, but it does ask us to learn to become more accountable and more enmeshed. Um, and I hope that the kind of configuration of thinking about um, these organisms as a kind of queer kin does that, does that same work. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and I'm happy to um, take questions or comments. Great, thank you so much, Heather. The, I, don't, I don't think you can hear people, but there was um, tremendous applause. Um, <laughs> um, Heather, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll start with a, um, a comment question and then we, we definitely have um, um, 
space and time and interest um, for comments or questions from you here um, and also from um, our guests online. And I think Marilyn will be passing me notes if there's anything of interest on YouTube. Um, you never know. Um, but but I th first, thanks again for your talk. It was since um, I, yeah, I was going to say I'm sort of a novice to, plas to plastic, the plastic theory. Um, it, it really, and to, to certain um, information, just plain old information about plastic um, and the ecology of plastic and the circulation of plastic, I found it in, in that sense informative and, and, um, and instructive. And w one of the things though that, that I had to think about, and I, excuse me if I in, indulge the connection to Derek Jarman for a moment, I, I didn't make that a necessary um, uh, like a secret code um, to participate <laughs> in these discussions that anyone has to know or even be interested in Derek Jarman. But, um, but, but since I am, and that, since his, uh, the garden was the departure point, I just had to think also about, and I don't know if you know this, Heather, but about him, um, the, the, his garden was located um, in Dungeness in this, um, uh, this, next to this cottage that he bought after he found out he was HIV positive. And, and the, the cottage is right next to this uh, nuclear power plant. And it always, um, for me, I, I remember when I saw the film at the kind of height of um, AIDS activism and kind of the development of, of AIDS cultural theory and queer activism and theory, um, it still was somehow opaque for me to, like I thought it was fascinating and radical and kind of punk of him to do that, but it somehow didn't immediately um, click with me. Um, I mean, over the years, and then particularly listening now to your to your talk, um, it it opened up how how there's a this this very interesting connection that he's um, making by perhaps by recognizing the toxicity within his body or this this the 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 chemicals he was starting to take um, to try to um, fight off um, this retrovirus that was just destroying his immune system um, and and sort of a recognition of, of his body as already, um, well, something he deeply had as, as queer, his body is already sort of not natural or as a, as a possibility to call into question the natural. But then indeed it got even further um, um, linked to, I guess what Paul Preciado calls the pharmacopornographic, uh, somehow the, the way in which the chemicals, the distinction between um, certain um, um, bodily affects and bodily desire and pleasure are um, are not entirely separate from the chemicals that that we put into our body, um, and so so I just had to think about like Derek Jarman, the garden, um, his own kind of increasingly toxic body, and his return to nature, which is a nature uh, um, mm -hmm. immediately that he sought out in proximity to this this nuclear power plant. Um, I, don't, I don't know if that um, is something that opens up further points of connection with some of your thinking about plastic. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I can definitely um, respond to that. I mean, um, I think that for me, one of the most sort of um, fascinating and interesting things, you know, why, why I really um, think it's incredibly useful for me to sort of think about think about queer theory in relationship to environmental questions, which is maybe not the most obvious thing to start mm -hmm. with, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like as you're sort of pointing out, it's like it's like what does AIDS have to do with um, a nuclear power plant, yeah, or what yeah. is why why turn to the garden to kind of like think through um, the kind of relationships of, of, of queerness, right? And I think that one of the things that's that's really sort of beautiful and really incredible um, in those juxtapositions is a couple of different things. One is that um, I think that it opens up um, questions of what we understand as the natural in really productive ways. Mm -hmm. So it's like blatantly untrue that, <laughs> that queerness is unnatural, right? Actually, mm -hmm. like if anything, humans are incredibly inadept at queerness as compared to the majority of organisms, like many of the organisms mm -hmm. on earth, right? Um, that lots of organisms can change sex and do throughout their lifetime fairly spontaneously and relatively easily. It's much more, it's much more difficult, much more laborious um, for humans to be able to do that. Um, 
And, and similarly, there's, you know, at least 450 documented um, animals that um, exhibit forms of lesbian or gay um, sex or coupling or desire or, you know, all of these kinds of things. And in mm -hmm. fact, it's like evolutionary advantageous to do that, right? It's not even a kind of um, problem in relationship to even sexual um, reproduction. So, um, so I think that like, that's one thing it really like opens up, it really kind of think lays bare the ways in which we think about um, how we think about nature as being natural, as being like really this, this matter of certain kinds of investments. And it really has very little to do with actually looking at um, the more than human world. And for me, that's, that's a really instructive place to start. Mm -hmm. um, and I think similarly, um, I think that there is a kind of desire for the more than human world to be this kind of pure space. Um, and, and it's just not, right? Like, like even beyond, even beyond all of the things that, 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 that capitalism and colonialism and, and industrialization and militarism, even beyond all of the things that, that have been introduced into the environment as a result of those systems, um, it's not that, um, that the more than human world was never um, poisonous or um, toxic or um, threatening or, you know, any of these things that that's, that's always been the case. And mm -hmm. so I think that, um, you know, and it also, I think, creates this, this really unhelpful um, way of thinking about humans as somehow entirely separate from the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I really like thinking with toxicity um, is because it, it forces us to recognize the ways in which the environment is our bodies, right? That our, that our bodies mm -hmm. are a, like literally a kind of just um, through the mechanisms of metabolism, through the mechanisms of breathing, through the porousness of our skins, um, whatever is out there is eventually going to come in. Um, and so I think that thinking, thinking in those more capacious ways outside of the kind of traps of individualism, outside of the traps of these kind of purity narratives or these desire for having something that's pure and untainted, um, I mean, I'm not saying that we should endorse petrochemical companies, <laughs> but mm -hmm. just to be clear, um, sometimes I think people think that that's sort of the route of going down. No, by all means, <laughs> try mm -hmm. to get them to stop doing what they're doing in every and any way you can possibly think of. But, but um, what they're doing is horrendous. But, but at the same time, now that we're in this state, I, like, I think that there are things that, that we can learn from it. Um, that is productive and useful in terms of not reproducing those same kinds of binary logics, those same kinds of purity narratives um, as we move forward. And I find specifically in the work of queer artists and queer theorists, mm -hmm. there is um, already an embrace of, of things beyond um, the individual, beyond the binary, beyond this kind of desire for something that's pure and untainted. I think that queer culture has always been interested in the gross and in the um, dirty and, <laughs> and it's like, you know, all of these things, right? That, that, yeah. that is part of what you're, makes you're, it To fun the gross and, and the dirty. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. Speaking of intoxicants, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> nice. No, yeah. No, that, that, um, sorry, I was, I'll take a sip. Mm. <laughs> no, that, that, um, that helped, that really helps me what you're talking about now. And also this talk helped me because, um, I remember my, my, my impression from the article that you wrote many years ago was, was, um, one in which the, the queer, the queer specificity of this relationship with toxicity, um, was not so clear to me. Um, I mean, I think it is clear. I'm not criticizing that essay now, but I'm, I'm more criticizing my, my, feel like my, or maybe my um, lack of, of um, ability to, um, to process that relationship um, at that time. And, and I, I know that I think like that, because I was thinking of like um, sexual practices with, with dildos, with, um, with uh, latex gloves and all of, all of the, the, the kind, in that sense, um, this battery or, or kind of fetish fetish scene with like latex that that made me think of the queer that the queer was like queer practices in relationship to plastics and eroticizing plastics um, but what I find um, what you're talking about 
um, today or what you focused on today um, is really thinking through this question of the unnatural and nature and also the question of kinship, um, which pulls more from queer um, um, life practices and perspectives than, than simply the very important sexual um, fetishization of plastic. Yeah, totally. And I mean, I think actually, I mean, I think actually maybe you're right. I mean, it was very generous of you to say that it was your own misreading, but I actually think that um, that article is like the beginning. It was like, it was really like 10 the years ago, I, I was, think. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when, when I was like thinking about these relationships and of course, like, yeah, one of the things that immediately comes to mind is sex toys, right? I mean, some yeah. of them are just made from silicone, which is technically not what I would consider a plastic because mm -hmm. it's not fossil fuel based, it's silica based. Um, but a lot of the cheaper stuff, um, or even latex, which um, sometimes you can get 100% pure latex gloves, right, but mostly right. mostly latex is actually a, a compound material that's like partially plastics and partially latex. Sorry, I just I <laughs> I always like to be very specific about the materiality of things, but. Um, but I think that, you know, like, I mean, who doesn't love certain plastic objects right like there's a way in which there's a way in which those textures. Um, both kind of elicit sort of feelings of desire, but mm -hmm. also maybe feelings of repulsion. And I think that 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 kind of um, the that kind of commingling of those feelings is also um, very present. I think in a lot of you know fetish scenes or um, kink scenes or you know other kinds of spaces that 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 queer folks often really circulate in. And so. Um, yeah, there's a way in which you think that those objects are still really important and kind of acknowledging the, the desire for this kind of material, just kind of like on a material basis, like on the ways mm -hmm. in which um, it's, it does mimic the skin, right? So that plastic becomes like another kind of a skin. Um, and I think that, it, that really kind of acknowledging the kind of sexual desirous aspect of those things, um, again, I think is something... Um, that is interesting and, and beyond sort of, or in addition to all of the other ways we can, which we can think right. of um, through these relations. Right, yeah, yeah, thank you, Heather. Maybe I'll just see if there are any comments or questions um, here. Sorry, there's a strange power uh, imbalance because I'm both behind the bar, I have all my drinks here, and I have this kind of Madonna microphone <laughs> um, and, Heather can't hear you directly, um, but that no. I hope that could instead allow some free space of thinking un without the pressure of the presenter hearing. But if, if you have any comments or questions, yeah, there is one, and I'll just repeat it then for Heather. Putting that together with what Heather was saying, that do, 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 do you mind if I interrupt you? Now and then just repeat, repeat it for her. Yeah, okay, so Heather, it's a it's a reflective comment um, from someone um, who is talking about um, how he went to the screening. There's a screening series in relation to this project, and went to the screening of the garden um, of Jarman's the garden. Right, and, and the reflection is that um, he's it is continuing and, and, and he's thinking about how Jarman in 1989 or 1990 or so made this garden. I think he bought the, cast, the cottage in 1987, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm. But, and, then, and then over the next few years made this garden, but he didn't um, do this kind of classic garden. And maybe I'm not, a, uh, maybe from your accent, maybe you know more about like British gardens, but there was no, no gate. Um, it was open, so it wasn't gated in and, and, and like contained nature. It was open. Right. And pick up all these right. materials, and some of it would be um, some of it would be all kinds of um, dentures, left over from the war, uh, all kinds of plastic and stuff washed up from the beach, uh, old bits of machinery, and brought those into the garden, so it kind of it was a, a very quick garden. 
Yeah, no, it's a wonderful observation um, that that because Jarman um, produced his garden um, in part by by um, going beachcombing and just collecting the residue that washed up on the beach, and it was a lot of there was some like war um, uh, remnants or things. I like iron work and, and of course driftwood, but then also plastics and different so-called unnatural things that he would then incorporate into this really quite spectacular garden. It sounds like it's actually, if you're not, if you're, your manuscript is not already sent in, um, <laughs> no, there's some nice, really nice, it's a nice reflection on, on, on living with, with plastic and toxicity. And, and, and so it was an, a comment and observation. Yeah. Do you maybe yeah, if I that sounds yeah yeah Heather oh, do you, sorry go ahead no no I was ahead. just going to ask if if there are, because this um, the garden um, like if there if if that is that kind of um, practice is something that you've encountered in your research on plastics I mean you're, you're working with like artists work I mean I know the this great Tejal Shah piece. Um, um, but I'm thinking just about the, the kind of unnatural, I mean, gardens are unnatural, right? They're, they're this kind of imposition on, on, on nature, so to speak. But, but if there's other, um, if, if, that's a, if that's a model, if the garden for you is in any way an important or, or possibly productive model for thinking further with questions of toxicity. Yeah, you know, I haven't actually um, really thought about that in depth, though. So thank you so much for that. Um, comments um, to the person in the audience um, and also for that kind of provocation mark. Um, yeah, I mean, I do think that there's something, I don't know, I mean, I guess a couple of sort of initial thoughts that come to my head and maybe these are sort of ill-formed <laughs> thoughts, but uh, but a couple, a couple of initial thoughts is that in some ways I feel like um, plastics have some of the same aspirations of, of, of the garden, you know, to, to kind of curate um, or to contain um, a certain kind of element of, of um, um, relations or ecological relationality. Um, but, you know, part of my, you know, part of my interest in plastics is also because of the fact that they're one of the very first materials that are molecularly engineered. Um, and so I'm really fascinated with what that means in terms of kind of thinking about a kind of molecular imaginary. So, um, so I guess that, mm. that sort of diverts from that. But I do think that the, this kind of um, question of what is the relationship of containment or what is the relationship of curation or what is the relationship of letting something go wild um, and that all the kinds of decisions that one has to make in relationship to the garden um, yeah, those are, that's a really interesting framing that I haven't really thought about. Mm -hmm. And then, I mean, the other thing that kind of immediately comes to mind is I went and saw this like BBC, one of these like BBC documentary things um, where um, there was a refugee camp and I'm forgetting where, so I'm um, sorry about that. But, um, it, and in the refugee camp, there was a, a scientist from, England who had figured out a way to use um, old mattresses as a growing medium and mm -hmm. and as I was watching this I couldn't you know it, it was presented as like the most amazing thing because there was all of these extra mattresses that couldn't be used um, and so people had figured out a way to, to use these mattresses as um, as this growing medium which was which was incredibly useful in terms of a hydroponic garden system um, which was incredibly useful because it allowed people to kind of recreate the gardens that they had in their homes um, mm -hmm. before they were displaced um, and it also um, it was also very beautiful in the ways in which, you know, it's kind of using these like found um, materials. Mm -hmm. um, but I also have to say that maybe this kind of works against my work, but, um, but there also was a part of me that was like slightly horrified um, because I was really concerned about what on earth was going to be in these people's food right? <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and whether it was really okay for people to be eating this. And then, you know, and then, then you, then you ask the question, okay, well, what are the alternatives? Right. And, mm -hmm. um, and I do think that like, I do think that this is kind of the, the, the kind of tension of, to of thinking with toxicity, right. Is that it's not that it doesn't have really material consequences. And I am very aware of the fact that 
that that tends to happen for people who do not look like me, who are not in my social position. And so there is a part of me that feels a little bit hesitant at like saying that toxicity should be um, embraced on certain kinds of levels. Mm -hmm. um, and I realize that that's kind of taking us away from the question of the gardens, but, mm -hmm. um, but I think it was like a really interesting example of um, the relationship between plastics and toxicity and food production um, that left me feeling incredibly ambivalent um, and at least sort of with a desire to know what was going into people's bodies and maybe what wasn't like mm -hmm. maybe maybe those maybe that was actually a great growing medium and, and there's nothing to be concerned about um, but I I think I do also feel um, that there's you know, it, it brings up all these questions of consent to right? Um, and part of the problem with something like plastic pollution is that it is imposed on people without their consent. Um, but then, you know, there's all kinds of other things that we live with that also don't involve models of consent, right? Like when we go outside and it's raining, there was no consent to that process. So, um, so I think it really, it really speaks to, well, how do we develop relations that are more consensual, right? Um, and how do we think about that? Um, and how do we also understand the ways in which we are at the mercy of, of, of so many different things that are so beyond us? Mm -hmm. and, and intervene as you've talked in your talk in, in the kind of racist, capitalist, um, colonial structures that that um, that may allow some of us to theorize living in toxicity far from to far from what um, tremendous uh, concentrations of toxicity, um, and and that that seems so. In that sense, it's it's important both to figure out how to live with it and how and figure out how to maybe how to spread the toxicity around more equally, like in a kind of equal opportunity toxicity or something. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, um, yeah, I'm sorry that took us away from gardens, but I really No, no, like no. That no, that's I mean that's the whole project is to kind of depart from the <laughs> garden and and continue reflecting and sometimes that sends us back to the garden anew. Um are there are there other comments or questions specific questions for Heather? People are are happy, um, <laughs> I think are happy listening. Yeah, there is, there is a, a comment, Heather, yes. Um, I was thinking uh, in um, the context of Heather's talk about uh, the way she talked about anonymous mm -hmm. and uh, waste. Um, so like kind of, um, there's this uh, really excellent paper by Dominic Itani and he talks about the sort of waste value capital price in, in sort of uh, this uh, colonization of waste Ah, that's super interesting. I wish um, I were capable of completely recapitulating, recapitulating what you were saying. But um, can you tell me who, who the theorist was who you mentioned? Uh, It's, um, yeah, I still wasn't able to get his name. Gitvani. Gitvani. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, d no, d um, Heather, it's a, um, a very interesting reflection on, um, specifically around colonialism and waste. And thinking of Gitvani, um, who writes about, um, 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 about the circulation of waste and value and, and 
referring to John Locke, um, but this um, very interesting comment is something I'm not able to really recreate here um, for you, unfortunately, but I think part of what I got was the, the kind of final questions we're um, taking from your discussion of um, queer kin and, um, and like petrochemical kin, um, and thinking of that in relation to uh, value and um, whether in what sense they, th these, um, this, these kin, and please correct me if I'm wrong and restate it, please, um, in what sense these kin are, are simply forming, um, are, are new forms of uh, value for capitalism, are, are new forms of capitalist value. But there are essential other parts of your that's comment. A, that's a great summary. Oh, <laughs> you're too kind. That was a horrible summary. But um, um, do you have thoughts about this? I, uh, did, did, did any of that make sense to you, what I said? Yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and I'm sorry I can't be here, be there to 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 hear the entire um, reflection. And also, I don't think I know of a theorist that you're referring to, so I won't be able to address um, that particular part. But I'm. I'll get. I'll get I'm the name specifically. And we'll send it to you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm grateful for the reference and and um, happy to look into it. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that for me. Uh, yeah, there's there's so there's so much to kind of unpack there. Um, I think that one of the things, one of the kind of attempts at a kind of intervention um, to think of these organisms as a kind of kin is actually to disrupt the mechanisms of um, value um, and the ways in which um, within advanced capitalism, within petrocapitalism, um, everything is just. Um, uh, put within these kinds of chains of accumulation um, and um, and value and like and to actually disrupt that and to say that there's other ways that we can think about think about these things um, because I mean one of the things that's really sort of important to the kind of circulation of plastics in general is that um, it really is a matter of um, you know, plastics in part have circulated so much just because of the oil industry um, and the oil industry's waste, right? So a lot of the waste that comes from the oil industry um, is directly used in the production of plastics. And so one of the things that's, um, you know, Amanda Butskis makes this really important argument in um, her book called Plastic Capitalism, um, where she talks about waste um, in relationship to, um, um, oh gosh, I'm I'm forgetting his name, the solar, solar anus guy, but but I um, and um, and and uh, and thinking about what value could be different, um, how value might be different under under a different kind of uh, understanding of energy expenditure, and and I think that um, you know I'm not a Bataille theorist, so um, so that's not really that's not really what I'm I'm interested in, but I do think that there's this, it's a similar project in sort of like understanding the ways in which. Um, plastic is produced from capitalism's um, excess waste that has then turned itself into a commodity um, that then gets circulated through the world, that then produces these new bacteria that then themselves are going to be commodified in order to be able to create, keep this kind of system going indefinitely and in, perpet in perpetuity. Um, and one of the things that I'm really interested in is any and all ways, imaginatively, figuratively, theoretically, conceptually, philosophically, or through direct action um, of being able to stop that, that, that mechanism, right? And so, mm -hmm. um, and so for me, proposing, proposing these um, objects as kin introduces a different type of a relational system that is not um, about value. Um, and maybe that's naive <laughs> to, to, try to, to try to propose something else um, or to say that, that um, the ways in which we build family and relationality um, is not um, completely controlled or um, captured through the mechanisms of capital. Um, but uh, I would at least like to continue to believe that that, that is the case, um, which isn't to say that there aren't avenues or um, places in which um, 
that mechanism of control and capture is happening, um, but rather to propose that if we really did think of these organisms as a kind of kin, that that would force us into a different type of relation with them, um, where they couldn't just be mechanisms for, for capital accumulation um, and actually had to be thought of differently. Um, and that is part of what the part of what the intervention is is trying to get at because it's obvious, it's just so obvious how how these kinds of frameworks of value um, are so um, harmful and have led to the kind of ecocidal conditions um, under which we find ourselves. So, but but I would yeah I'm, I feel like there's probably other parts of your question that I'm not responding to or getting, um, but I hope that I hope that that is some kind of um, a response. And um, yeah, I, I look forward to, to, to reading the theorist that you're re referring to. Yeah, thank you, Heather. Is, I, I think I dropped out the whole colonialism aspect in your, in your question. Did you want to um, add something? Right, right, yeah. right. Yes, um, the, our um, guest was um, saying that thinking that maybe perhaps what you're proposing is is a form of counter value to this capitalist value, or are you thinking that that kinship escapes this kind of value um, uh, production entirely? This capitalist value production entirely. This kinship model. Yeah, that's that. That's, that's the hope. <laughs> that's the wager okay. right um because you know um i mean i'm not a marxist i'm not trained in those fields i'm not a hegelian um you know so um, what are you Heather? you know i would i would i would hate to <laughs> what am i <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no no you don't have to answer um, but, that you know <laughs> no. um but uh but, you know, um, so forgive me if this is a radical simplification, but I do think that there's something about just proposing a counter to something that, that still means that you're trapped within its logics. Mm. Um, and what I wanted to say is that, is that kinship is a way, maybe not an escape entirely. I don't know if I, if I totally um, think that that is possible in the present moment, but I do think that you know, just in the same way that queer folks have built communities of kinship that that do escape heteronormative models, which isn't to say that that always happens or, or that there isn't a drive or a desire or a pull um, through legal mechanism, normative, you know, societal pressures in those directions, but rather that there's all kinds of examples of people who are not just doing something counter, but just sort of something with a complete disregard for, for mm. heteronormativity. Um, mm. And I feel like, um, you know, or for example, um, if we wanna think about other, other examples through like, you know, indigenous kinship systems um, or the systems that black folks were kind of forced into, um, into making um, as a result of, of um, the mechanisms of slavery, I think that those are vibrant and creative responses that aren't just a counter example to slavery or to systems of colonization, um, but rather are themselves a kind of life world, a building of a creative and vital life world that, um, that isn't just a counter mechanism and doesn't also completely escape it, but that somehow um, provides something different and yet also isn't, um, how do I say, it provides something different that is a different way of living without just being a counter to something. Mm -hmm. Nice, yeah. And that maybe doesn't completely escape mm -hmm. it, but still has to grapple with it and yet right. is somehow residing outside of it. Right, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Heather. That No, that was very clarifying, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Are there... Um, <coughs> <coughs> Are you <Excuse> okay? <laughs> <coughs> I am. Um, okay, now I'm better. Um, yes, um, if there are no more comments in Maryland, did we have no comments? Okay, it's sometimes really good if you have no comments on YouTube because those YouTube comments, those anonymous YouTube comments are pretty sometimes difficult to take. Um, Great. Well, I, um, I'm so thankful 
that you were able to be with us in this way, Heather, um, and also to kind of to start this series because it really did open up so many unexpected, for me, unexpected um, connections with Jarman <laughs> that that weren't um, that that were were there in my thinking uh, of inviting you, but um, but that that I didn't really didn't want to chain you down to. And I think also this, this reflection that you just made about kinship is something that we could really take with us to think about the reflection on kinship in this particular film, The Garden, where he has like two, like a gay couple who become, who are kind of like a Jesus figure and Tilda Swinton with this baby and then the gay couple have the baby. There's very interesting kind of shifts um, in, in um, kinship relations that are very, um, um, that are open, um, open-ended. And there, there's this kind of openness to it that that um, that I think is really quite nice um, as a kind of maybe as the example as one example of queer kinship forms that that perhaps you're relying on to think through um, a kind of a, a, a plastic um, kin and bacterial kin. So um, so I'm really thankful to you. Um, for being here and for your talk. Um, and thank you all um, here for being present. Um, so maybe we could um, give another round of applause that Heather won't hear um, to thank her. <laughs> Everyone's clapping really loudly <laughs> right now. Okay, thank you so much, Heather. And um, I hope, um, um, as, uh, as Heather knows, um, she will be here present um, in the exhibition, um, the talk that, that she gave in our discussion um, for the next um, couple weeks. So if you want to revisit um, some of what she said, you can do so, or also on the YouTube channel of Silent Green for those who are not able to come to Berlin. And um, I hope to see many of you and, um, and to have many people on YouTube um, for the next two events on uh, August 12th and then August 18th. And we will work at um, enabling, disturbing this power imbalance so that um, audience members can be heard um, by our speakers. Um, I apologize that that wasn't possible this time, um, but that will be corrected. Okay, thank you very much and thank you, Heather, again. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. My pleasure. Have a good evening, everyone. Mm -hmm.